All right, we're going to do a little video right now on, about the perennial philosophy, or or it's actually just called perennial philosophy. And I'm going to put the the links uh, to what I'm reading in the description. Please don't mind the uh, so, someone is uh, doing some weeding out there. I hope hope it's not too loud. But um, anyway, um, the reason I'm doing this is because I did a video yesterday about New Age. And, and the question is, A Course in Miracles, a New Age philosophy or a New Age um, teaching or a New Age thought system? And the answer I gave was, no, it, it is not. And today I'm going to explain why A Course in Miracles is more um, in the vein or in the tradition of perennial philosophy than New Age. And how is, how is perennial philosophy different than New Age? Um, and by the way, New Age is not really that much of a thing anymore. It used to be, you know, back in the, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. These days, New Age really has kind of fallen out of favor. It's not as much of a movement. Um, it, there was something called the New Age movement. It, it, was, it was a thing, you know, for a while. Um, Perennial philosophy is something that has been around, right? And it, and it will be around. It's, it's, it's like timeless wisdom, the wisdom of the ages. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to focus on Aldous Huxley. And the reason I'm, I'm going to talk about him uh, in particular today is because he had a book called The Perennial Philosophy. So he, he actually did a book called The Perennial Philosophy with quotes from a lot of different um, scriptures and teachers uh, over the ages, and it's a very good book, and I used to have it, but I don't have it anymore. Um, and Aldous Huxley, you know, he also was a very interesting figure. Um, people know him because a lot of people read Brave New World, like in high school. I, I read that in high school. Um, Huxley also was the person that... Um, famously wrote The Doors of Perception, and that had an influence on popular culture because The Doors took their name from Huxley, uh, but it originally started uh, with um, William Blake. So Huxley was, was just borrowing from William Blake with that title. Um, but <clears throat> the other thing um, about Huxley is, is that he, um, he published The Perennial Philosophy in 1945, and that was you know, when the atomic bomb, I, I did I did a video yesterday on the atomic bomb and on Oppenheimer. And so Huxley published, right at the end of World War II, he published that book, The Perennial Philosophy. And then Huxley didn't live that much longer. He, he died in the early 60s. And he died just as LSD was becoming popular in in society. And, and as he was dying, he, he asked to... Um, to take LSD. He was, he was dying and he, he took some LSD <laughs> as he was dying. So, um, this was before, um, you know, it got crazy with LSD. Um, and, and this is when, um, LSD was, didn't have the name that it had a little bit later, but, um, let's read about perennial philosophy. What is perennial philosophy? And I'm just reading from Wikipedia. Um, the perennial philosophy, or Latin, is philo 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 philosophia perennis, also referred to also referred to as perennialism and peren peren perennial wisdom. What is perennial? Perennial means like throughout all time, throughout the ages. Right, the the, the wisdom of the ages is the way I would put it is a school of thought in philosophy and spirituality which posits that the recurrence of common themes across world religions illuminates universal truths about the nature of reality, humanity, ethics, and consciousness. Some perennialists emphasize common themes in religious experiences and mystical traditions across time and culture, while others argue that religious traditions share a single metaphysical truth or origin from which all esoteric and exoteric knowledge and doctrine has grown. Um, so some perennialists emphasize common themes, like Huxley did. That's what his book tried to show. Um, 
Others argue that religious traditions share a single metaphysical truth or origin from which all esoteric and exoteric knowledge and doctrines has, gro has, has grown. Um, I'm not sure if Huxley held that view himself, but others have. And I, w I would say that I hold that, you know, I hold that view that, that there is a common, you know, there's that saying that I keep coming back to, which is that truth is one, paths are many. Right? Truth is one, paths are many. So there is one truth, and there's different expressions um, of paths that come as a result of, um, you know, coming in different times, different places, different cultures, different language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So th those are all like the, um, the differences in form, but the content remains the same, right? The, 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 the goal and the, and the, um, the final goal, it remains the same. Um, you could also say perennial philosophy is what Hinduism's real name is. It's the same basic idea, and it, the name in, in Sanskrit is Sanatana Dharma, which sometimes gets tr translated as the eternal way, but you could translate sanatana also as perennial, like the perennial way. You could also say the perennial philosophy. It's, <laughs> um, you could say. I'm, I'm not saying you you, you will, but <laughs> but I, I I would say that, that that there's a case to be made that that sanatana dharma could be translated as perennial philosophy. Perennialism has its roots in the Renaissance interest in Neoplatonism and its idea of the one from which all existence emerges. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but the guy that, that, that coined the term was a guy named Agostino Stilcio. I guess he was um, Italian, and, and that was 1497 to 1548 that he lived. That was in the Renaissance. So he coined that term. Developments in the 19th and 20th centuries integrated Eastern religions and universalism. Uh, sorry. Yeah, developments in the 19th and 20th centuries integrated Eastern religions and universalism. The idea that all religions underneath seeming differences point to the same truth. Right? One truth, many paths. In the early 19th century, the transcendentalists, that was like Emerson, Thoreau, Walt Whitman, and others, propagated the idea of, of a metaphysical truth and universalism which inspired the Unitarians who proselytized among Indian elites. Toward the end of the 19th century, the Theosophical Society further popularized universalism, not only in the Western world, but also in Western colonies. In the 20th century, this form of universalist perennialism was further popularized by Aldous Huxley and his book, The Perennial Philosophy, which was inspired by Neo-Vedanta. Huxley and some other perennialists ground their point of view in the commonalities of mystical experience and generally accept religious syncretism. So the mystical experience, so, so, so the mystical experience is primary, right? The, es the esoteric truth is, is taken to be primary and is the common ground from which all the different religions stem. And that's how you can. That's why you can be universalist in, in in regard to religion, and see that they're all basically coming from the same place, even though they look different on the surface. Also, in the 20th century, the anti-modern traditional school emerged in contrast to the universalist approach to perennialism, inspired by Advaita, Advaita Vedanta, Sufism, and 20th century works critical of modernity, such as. Rene Guénon's uh, The Crisis of the Modern World, traditionalism emphasizes a metaphysical single origin of the orthodox religions and rejects syncretism, scientism, and secularism as deviations from the truth contained in the concept of tradition. So, this is something else that we could go into another time, the traditionalist school. Um, one last thing here, What's the definition? How would you define perennial, the perennial philosophy? There is no universally agreed upon definition of the term perennial philosophy, and various thinkers have employed the term in different ways. 
for all perennialists, the term denotes a common wisdom at the heart of world religions, but exponents across time and place have differed on whether or how it can be defined. Um, let's read on. Some perennialists emphasize a sense of participation in an ineffable, tru ineffable truth discovered in mystical experience, though ultimately beyond the scope of complete human understanding. Others seek a more well-developed metaphysics. Um, that is more how A Course in Miracles looks at it, right? Um, a Course in Miracles says, you know, seek only the experience. Don't let theology delay you. You No theology is going to get it right. Um, there's always going to be room for debate. But you can get lost in the debate. You can get lost in all the talk and you can miss out on the experience by just doing the practice, right? You have to do the practice um, to get to the experience. And the practice is does not depend on what you believe, right? The practice is uh, beyond theology. Um, Oh, all right, but all right, buddy. So, so the ineffable mystical experience—that—that's also something that William James talked about in the varieties of religious experience. Bye, bye, bye. And I'm gonna do another video on William James. William James was amazing, and he and his series of lectures, which which was made into a book called "The Varieties of Religious Experience," is definitely worth reading. And at one point I was teaching, I, I did a little course in Florida and I was teaching that book, William, you know, William James among others. Um, so then you have Aldous Huxley's book, The Perennial Philosophy. It was published in 1945 and it got a lot of press at that time. Um, it's a comparative study of mysticism by the British writer and novelist Aldous Huxley. Its title derives from the theologic, theological tradition of perennial philosophy. Um, it came out uh, right after the war, right after World War II. Um, the first British ed edition um, had on the jacket, the perennial philosophy is an attempt to present this highest common factor of all theologies by assembling passages from the writings of those saints and prophets who have approached a direct knowledge of the divine. The book um, offers readers who are assumed to be familiar with the Christian religion and the Bible a fresh approach employing Eastern and Western mysticism. And Mr. Huxley quotes from the Chinese Taoist philosophers, from followers of Buddha and Muhammad, from the Brahmin scriptures and from Christian mystics ranging from St. John of the Cross to William Law, giving preference to those whose writings often illuminated by genius are unfamiliar to the modern reader. And then finally it says, in this profoundly important work, Mr. Huxley has made no attempt to found a new religion, but in analyzing the natural theology of the saints, as he has described it, he provides us with an absolute standard of faith by which we can judge both our moral depravity as individuals and the insane and often criminal behavior of the national societies we have created. That's all I'm going to say about that. I hope you can hear me here. Um, Finish up there. There's those that paper in there that keeps the paint in there. Yeah, but let's open this up. Let's open See, this up I told you, quick. Dad. Bro, what you mean? Yo, bro. I need okay. To go get here you go, bud. I need to get all right. <laughs> A little break here. We're gonna. We're, I'm gonna do some quotes um, here in a moment by Aldous Huxley. Um, some quotes just to 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 see what he was saying about the about things. Um, he was definitely brilliant, right? Aldous Huxley was brilliant thinker and writer, one of the most influential in the 20th century. Um, I'm gonna do one more paint here. here you go, bud. Um, it's pink. Yeah, I got, I got that. And then we'll finish this video, bud. Well, we're going to read some Aldous Huxley quotes. Um, uh, 
Here you go, bud. Guys! Here you go, bud. Take that. Put the top on. Remember? Here you go, bud. All right. All right, let's read some of these quotes. Um, we're going to start with... Um, All right, let's start with a simple one. There's only one corner of the universe you can be certain of improving, and that's your own self, right? Of Course in Miracles says, seek not to change the world, seek only to change your, your mind about the world. Um, and so focus on your own self-improvement and the world will change actually as you do that work, as you do that inner work. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you mad. Um, Gloria Steinman had a similar quote, which is, the, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Right? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make, make you mad. Why is that? Because um, the truth is um, hard to believe, right? And, and we all resist the simple truth. And... We, um, the simple truth is that we are mad, <laughs> right? It'll make you mad that we are mad. That's two, two, um, uses of the word mad, right? Mad as in angry, but mad as in crazy. It is a bit embarrassing to have been concerned with the human problem all one's life and find at the end that one has no more to offer by way of advice than, quote, try to be a little kinder. <laughs> and, I chose this one also because Ken Wapnick was asked, you know, how would you sum up A Course in Miracles? And he said, try to be a little kinder. So he might have gotten it from Aldous Huxley. Um, right. And that's basically the bottom line is A Course in Miracles is bringing you closer and closer to being a, a kind person. Kindness. It's everything, right? All that really matters in the end is is kindness. I think Jewel had a song, you know, Who Will Save Your Soul. I think that was the song where she, she ends with um, all that matters is kindness in the end. I have a song like that too. An intellectual is a person who's found one thing that's more interesting than sex. And I thought of that um, because of Helen. Helen did one sex in A Course in Miracles and she said, "This finally, this is something for the intellectuals, right? The course. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is more interesting. This is, I would say, I, would, I wouldn't say an intellectual. I would say a lover of the truth. A lover of the truth has found something more interesting than sex. I know this is annoying. I hope, I hope I'm, you can hear me. Okay. Most ignorance is vincible ignorance. We don't know because we don't want to know. Right? We don't know because we don't want to know. Man approaches the unattainable truth through a succession of errors. Man approaches the unattainable, unattainable truth through a succession of errors. If you look at your life, you'll see that's, that's true. You had to make mistakes in order to learn and to get to the truth. To talk about religion except in terms of human psycho psychology is an irrelevance. And that is also A Course in Miracles approach. You have to look at, at psychology. That is, and that's where the Course brings in Freud and, and bases a lot on Freud. So you can't really look at you can't look at religion without the psycho-spiritual dimension of it. Who lives longer, the man who takes heroin for two years and dies, or a man who lives on roast beef, water, and potatoes till 95? One passes his 24 months in eternity. All the years of the beef eater, beef, beef eater are lived only in time. So Aldous Huxley is making a very profound point, which is, first of all, you can't judge. Just because someone lives a long t time does not mean that their life was necessarily better than someone who lives a short amount of time. Um, but someone who, who is addicted to heroin, maybe they have a profound understanding of life through their um, 
exploration of the psyche while you know experiencing heroin we don't know we really don't know um now some people <laughs> would definitely argue with that i, I understand but i think huxley was open-minded enough to say you know i don't know i really don't know i mean he he seemed to be saying well probably the the person that took heroin and lived a short life they they probably lived a lot in those two years <laughs> Right, and that's why um, you could say rock stars that die young. Maybe they live more than most people ever live, you know, in the in the short amount of time. Like, take Jim Morrison, who died when he was twenty-seven, and he looked like he was forty-seven when he died. Um, maybe, you know, pe people like him just lived a ton in a very short amount of time. A totally unmystical world would be a world totally blind and insane. So obviously Huxley privileged the mystical, right? He, he, like, like me and like many others who are into the into the mystic, including Van Morrison, um, um, understand the mystical basis of religion and spirituality. In that um, mysticism really is the antidote for the insanity of the world. Thought must be divided against itself before it can come to any knowledge of itself. And that's similar to what he said before when he said, um, man approaches the unattainable truth through a succession of errors. And... Um, you know, you, you struggle with your ego until you realize that the ego is the problem, right? Um, so you're a house divided against yourself until you realize there is another way, right? There's an alternative. You don't have to follow the ego. And that is the road. That's the royal road to, to knowledge. An, unexcited, uh, un, an unexciting truth may be eclipsed by a thrilling lie. And that is the story of this world. <laughs> the unexciting truth of reality versus um, the thrilling lie of the illusion. I'm, I'm kind of going quickly through some of these. Th those who have been following A Course in Miracles and have been studying A Course in Miracles will, will completely understand these things uh, or, or will be more familiar with these ideas and others might not right who have not been doing the study and the practice but but it, as long as you're listening you'll you'll um you'll pick up uh, you know all gods are homemade and it is we who pull their strings and so give them power to pull ours and that's that's what freud said as well right that, that we've made up the gods in our own image um that's the ego the ego creates god in its own image and then thinks that God is real. And it's not. It's not the true God. Right? The true God is, is changeless, formless, beyond anything we can think or imagine or conceive of. That's the mystical understanding, right? There isn't any formula or method. You learn to love by loving, by paying attention and doing what one, what one thereby discovers has to be done. I'm going to read that again. There isn't any formula or method. You learn to love by loving, by paying attention, and doing what one thereby discovers has to be done. Everyone has their own journey in life, right? There's no... You can't really live by a dogma. Um, there's no... Or a formula. Or a method. Um, the Course does not give you a method. It gives you... Um, it gives you general ideas, general and abstract ideas that then you can use specifically in your own life as it applies to your life. Um, everyone has their own path, right? And, uh, this is a long video and I hope you were able to hear it. And, um... This is a video just to sum up on the perennial philosophy, the perennial wisdom of humankind. 
emphasis on the kind and it's all coming down to kindness <laughs> in the end only kindness matters right um, and and the, and the perennial wisdom is all about um, how to get there and great minds think alike and the great minds of every culture civilization time and place have discovered the same truths doesn't matter what culture they've been a part of right and that's where we can get past these ideas of you know these racial um, and you know uh, what's the word um, man I forgot what the word is um, not egocentric but um, thinking your culture is better right um, culture, cultural hegemony <laughs> or, or cultural superiority like my culture or my religion is better than this other culture or religion well it's only because you're, you're not comparing apples with apples you're comparing apples with oranges right? you're, you're, you're comparing the best in your tradition with the worst in someone else's tradition but if you compare the best with the best you're going to see that they're all getting to the same thing, right? They, you know, if you compare the Gospels with the Upanishads, you're going to see you're going to see something, you know, incredible there. Or the Gospels with the Bhagavad Gita. Um, anyway, that's it for now. Huxley also actually wrote. I might do another video on this. He wrote a. Um, introduction to the Bhagavad Gita uh, so I'll, I'll probably read that another time hopefully this was helpful today talking about perennial philosophy and also coming on the heels of my video on um, New Age philosophy and how is this different than New Age philosophy this goes a little deeper you know it, it goes gets into mysticism mysticism is a deeper subject so I'll leave it at that. That was a long video and, and hopefully this was helpful and uh, not too painful. <laughs> See you soon. I'm going to do one more video today and I'll try to do it without the, uh, the weed cutter there. Thanks.